Good morning. Welcome everybody to worship this morning. Uh, before we get started, we have a few announcements. Uh, today is meeting Sunday, so the deacons will meet following worship, and the outreach committee will meet at 3 o'clock downstairs. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study will be at 6 p.m. this week. Um, and then next Sunday, the 17th, we'll be starting a couple different things. Uh, at 4 p.m. here at the church, we'll have our communicants class for our kids. Um, and then at 5 p.m., we'll be starting a young family Bible study. So uh, be here at 5. We'll have supper for you. Um, we'll have something to do for the kids while we uh, sit and talk and figure out kind of where we want to go with this Bible study. But uh, invite everybody to come out for that. As well as on the 21st, which is not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, uh, we'll be feeding the Cougar football team. So if you are able to help with that, uh, please let me know. And as we get more information closer to time, I will get that out to everyone. And so um, that's all the announcements I have for us, but I know Rebecca has one. Uh, so. Good morning. Ladies, it's time for another conversation. It'll be October 6th, which is Friday evening, 6.30 to 8.30. And if you've been doing what we've talked about back in February, we want to hear about it. So the conversation will be on October 6th. All right, now, so we've, we've come and to celebrate and to worship the Lord. So let's be called to worship him from Psalm 118, verses 28 and 29. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come again before you here today, and we... Praise your holy name, for you are our God. And what a wonderful statement that is, that we who are broken people can call you our God, not only as our creator, but as the one who's loved us, the one who cares for us, the one who continues to guide us in every part of our lives. And so, Lord, we come and we give you the glory, we give you the praise here today. Lord, as we have gathered together, Lord, may this be a time that is a blessing to us. Lord, may you build us up, may you encourage us, may you convict us, may you equip us, Lord, that we might do that which is pleasing in your sight as we leave here today. Glorify you in all that we do. And Lord, now we pray as we worship you, Lord, may you get the glory, may you get the praise. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning, I invite you to stand together, is number 380, Savior Like a Shepherd, lead us.
Let's pray. Our gracious God, you are the Lord and you are the giver of life and you are the giver of all that we have. Lord, you have provided us with the clothes on our backs, the roof over our heads, the food on the table, our jobs, our families, our vehicles. You have provided us with it all. And Lord, we take a moment to thank you for your provision. And we take a moment to remember that you will care for us always. In moments of plenty and in moments of want, your guiding hand is upon us in it all. And so, Lord, now we take a moment to give back to you, trusting not in our finances, not in what we have, but in you who has given it to us in the first place. Lord, may you use these tithes, may you use the offerings for you, for your glory, and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, And we come this morning and confess the faith of the God that we believe in. And so I ask you this morning, Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes back uh, from the Old Testament to us in the book of Leviticus. Chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. Hear now God's word. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are indeed a holy God. You are set apart from it all, above all things. And Lord, you deserve the praise. You deserve the glory. Yet, Lord, we know that we don't glorify you like we should. Lord, we are sinful people. We often focus more on the things of our daily life than upon you. It's so easy to get caught up in the rat race of life, whether it be our jobs, raising our families, uh, or many other hobbies or things in this life, it's so easy to forget about you without even realizing it. And yet we are reminded here today as we come into your presence to worship you, that you are a God who is with us, a God who has loved us, and a God who calls us his people. And Lord, may you remind us here that we are your people here today. And because we are yours, Lord, there is a way that we ought to be living this life. For, Lord, we live in a fallen world that says 
one thing or another, but we know what your truth says. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to follow it. Lord, help us to live a life that is honoring to you in every single part of it. For Lord, it's so easy to live for you in certain places, but not in others. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to have a life that honors you in all of our life, in our jobs, in public, with our children, with our spouse, when we're alone here at church. May it all be consistent with seeking to live for you. For Lord, you are a holy God, and you call us as your people to be holy. And this is not because of anything that we have done, not because of any righteousness or place with you that we have earned, but because of your grace in Jesus Christ who came into this world to make us holy. Lord, who took on our sin and gave us his righteousness, that we would be set apart as your people for your work and to show the world Jesus in all that we do. So, Lord, may you help us to be holy here today. May you help us to be holy the rest of this week and in the days to come, every single day. May we live our lives in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you, not simply out of obligation, but also out of thanksgiving for who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, help us to be lights in this dark world. For, Lord, it is a dark world indeed. We see sin running rampant. We see the sins that we struggle with every day. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to overcome those sins for you. And then, Lord, help us to shine like lights in the darkness to share Jesus with those around us. Lord, we know the people in our lives that don't know you. And, Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunities to share you with them. Maybe through a kind word, maybe through an action, maybe through a question they might ask us. Lord, give us opportunities to share Christ with one another. Lord, that they too may come to know you personally as we do as well. Lord, we thank you for your caring for our church. We thank you that you continue to build our church. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue to remember that you are the one that's in control. May we lean on you for hope, for help as we seek to continue to minister to this community. And, Lord, may you continue to build us up for you and for your glory. And, Lord, there are many things that are upon our hearts here today as we come to worship. Lord, and we take a moment to offer all of those to you in silent prayer. And now, Lord, when we don't know what to pray, we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. But I want to stand together. Our second hymn this morning is number 390, Open My Eyes That I May See. Eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Grant me, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes. Thank you. 
silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, I will to see. Open my heart, illumine me. Spirit divine. Maybe seated. The children come forward for the children's message.
I mean, she could stay up here if she wanted to. It wouldn't bother me. <laughs> I invite everybody else to turn with me in your Bibles. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of John. Looking at John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. And here in this passage, uh, it's continuing on in what we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, it's the prayer that he has the night that he is arrested. Um, a prayer that he ends up praying out loud for his disciples to hear who write it down, and so that we hear it today as well. And one of the things that I mentioned last week as we started looking at this is I think Jesus prays out loud for a reason, so that we know what he is praying about, not only for him, as we saw last week, but as we will look at in our passage today, to know that he is also praying for us. Because the next thing he prays for in these verses is for his disciples. And so... Before we see how he prays for his disciples, us included in that, let's go to him for help before we read his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the encouragement, for the truth, for the blessing that it is for us. And Lord, we pray that you would just speak to us through it today. Open our hearts and our minds to receive it. Give us the attention to pay, to pay attention. And Lord, to remember it and to practice it in our lives. For Lord, it's, your truth is a blessing to us in so many ways. And so Lord, today we pray that you would show us this truth for our good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. Hear now God's word. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you give them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know them in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. I'll pray for you. How many of you had ever had somebody tell you that before? Whenever you're going through something hard, difficult, painful, and you tell somebody what's going on, the tendency as a Christian is those are the words that you hear. I'll pray for you. Or let's say you hear somebody else telling you all about what's going on, going wrong in their life. You tell them, I'll pray for you. If you think about it, that's a typical phrase we use in the Christian life. It's a phrase that gives us comfort. Now, sadly, I think many times we say, I'll pray for you, and either A, we forget, or B, we just simply say it, like a knee-jerk reaction, like that's what all Christians are supposed to say. But it's actually an encouragement to know that somebody is actually praying for you. Whether right then and there they say, I'll pray for you, and they pray for you right then, or say that they're praying for you out the week, that's a comfort, isn't it? Because when you think about prayer, you have people that say they're praying for. They are going before the Almighty God who can do the impossible to ask Him to do what you cannot do in your own life. And if you have multiple people praying for you at once, that's even more encouraging. Here's you have, you have multiple people petitioning the Almighty God for you. And the more prayers that are lifted up, the more encouraged you get. 
And so if somebody says, I pray for you, I'll pray for you. We do find ourselves having our spirits lifted. But also, not only that the fact they're praying, but it just simply tells you they, they care about you, right? To say that they're praying for it reminds you that they love you, that they want the best for you, that they are concerned about you. And so not only are you encouraged because of the actual prayer, but you're encouraged because this person cares about you enough to pray. If you stop and think about the people in your life that pray for you, it's a blessing. You know, I can tell you, there are many times that many of you have said that you are praying for me, and that's an encouragement to me because, trust me, I need it. And yet we also either don't know or we tend to forget is there's actually somebody else out there that's praying for all of us as Christians. It's not just your loved ones. It's not just your family members. It's not just your fellow church members or your friends. We find out here in our verses this morning that there is another person that's praying for you. That's far greater than anybody else. And that is we see here that Jesus Christ himself is praying for you as his people. Just think about that. How wonderful is that? I mean, it's like having the president, well, a president that you like that you voted for. It's like having him pray for you. Because here you are, just an individual in this entire nation, and then they are the leader of the entire nation, to hear that they are praying for you specifically. That's amazing. And if you look at Jesus here, this is like, the president praying for you, but on steroids. You have the king of the universe himself is praying for you. As you just think about that, yes, it encourages us when other people pray for us, but we hear that Jesus prays for us. What a wonderful thing that is. Wherever you might be in life, to know that Christ is praying for you, that can give you an encouragement and in comfort wherever you might be. For in these verses, we see that that's exactly what he's doing. He's praying for you as his people. And as we walk through this, we'll see just why that is such an encouragement for us. Because as you look here, you'll see just first who it is Jesus prays for. Then you see what Jesus prays for. First, what he prays will not happen to you. And lastly, what he prays will happen to you. All to show us the encouragement we can have in our Savior's prayer. So as you begin to look at this passage as Jesus is praying, he is, remember, he's prayed for himself first, but now he changes the subject of who he prays for. And we see first who it is that Jesus prays for in verses 6 through 10. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So you look at these verses and you ask the question, who is it that Jesus is praying for? We can be told that it is the ones that the Father has given him out of the world. They are the fathers, and he has given them to the Son. Again, showing Jesus is divine here. And if you stop and think about it for a second, everybody in the world is God's. There's one person, I can't remember who said it, but there's nothing in this world that God looks out and cannot say, mine. Everything is his. He is the creator. He has made it. He's made everything. And so there's, in a sense, every single person in this world can say that they are God's because he made you. But Jesus is referring to something a little bit different here. If you notice here, he's talking about those that are Come out of the world. Jesus says, I am not praying for the world, but those whom you have given me. Out of the world. If you look back at verse number 6. You see, the, the idea here is that out of the world, there's a people that God has chosen as his own. Not of anything that you have done, but by his grace. If you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, that tells us, that even while we were dead in our trespasses, we have been made alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. It, later on in that chapter it says, It's by grace you have been saved through faith. For this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. We see that God has chosen a people. By His grace, not by any merit or anything that we have done. 
And so we find out that Christ is praying for these people in particular. For they are God's and they are also his. They have been given to him. And if we think about that for a second, that's a hard subject to talk about. And I'm not going to belabor the point, because in Sunday school, if you stay today, we're going to be talking more about election and how all that works. But it makes us think, okay, if God has chosen a certain people, not based on any merit or anything that we do, how can I know if I am one of those people? How can I know if I am one of these people that Jesus is talking about here? Now, you might not be able to tell if your neighbor is one of those people or not. But you yourself can know. And here's why. Because we find out that those who are Christ are those who have responded to him in faith. If you look at how he highlights it here, he's talking about these people that are his. It says, now they know everything that you've given me is from you. They believed. For I've given them the words you gave me and they have received them. And have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. You see, there's a faith element in all of this. Those that are Christ are those that have believed, that have responded in faith. Christ has come, and we're told he has manifested God's name. Not just in the sense where he's going around telling people, oh, by the way, God's name is Yahweh. The idea of revealing God's name to people is somebody's name reveals who they are. He has revealed who God is, what God is like, what his character is. In himself, if you think about Jesus, he is God in the flesh, come into the world. And so Jesus has come, and he has told the disciples all of who he is, and we find out the disciples, they have believed it all. Everything that Jesus has said, they have trusted in. Now, do you think the disciples un- understood everything fully? If you read the Bible, no, they didn't. They didn't understand it all. They were very confused at times, and yet they still accepted, although they didn't quite grasp it, they accepted all that Jesus said was true. They kept his word by committing to follow God, not simply just with their lips, but in their hearts. And it's these people that have put their trust in Jesus Christ that are those that he prays for. Not just the world in general. There are other moments in the Bible when he prays for the world in general, but this is not one of them. He prays for his people. All those who have received him and believed in him and then have sought to live their life for his glory. There are many people that say they believe in Jesus, but the truth is those that know Christ are those that live in a way that shows Christ. For if you look here, that's why Jesus says, In verse number 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Those that are his people glorify Jesus in their lives. Do we do it perfectly? No, we fall short. But that's our desire. That's our want from our heart. And so if you have answered yes to those things, if you have believed in Jesus and you're seeking to live your life for him, then you can know that you are his. And I understand your minds might be off in left field now that I'm mentioning all this. This is a difficult subject. Because here on one hand you have God's choosing, God's electing, and then on the other side you have free will, our choosing. And it's hard and confusing to see how these two things mix together. But the truth is the Bible teaches both of these things. And you can know that they're both true. If you think about that pencil, maybe when you were back in school you tried to balance that pencil on your finger. If it leaned too much this way, it fell off. If it leaned too much that way, it fell off. But if you got it right in the middle, it balanced just right. That's the idea here. You have election on one side, free will on the other, and they balance. Do we know exactly how? No. But that's when we need to take a page out of the disciples' book here. In verse number 8, it says, For I have given the words you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and have believed that you sent me. Does this mean the disciples understood everything Jesus said? No, but they believed him, even though they didn't understand. And while this is a difficult topic, we might not understand we can still believe that it's true. Now, many of you might be getting bogged down and might not not hold to any of that. Don't let that distract you from the beauty of what this is trying to tell you. Is look, here you have Jesus Christ praying for a people who are his. By no merit of their own, by no good deed that we have done, we are sinners and yet we have been saved by grace and we have our Savior praying for us. We have God calling us to be his own in spite of ourselves. That if you have responded in faith, you can know that you are his. And you can know that here Jesus is praying for you. But what is it that Jesus prays for you here? Well, there are two things that he prays. A negative request and a positive request. And when I say a negative, what I mean is that something would not happen. 
And so here he prays that the disciples would not be kept. Excuse me, they would be kept from the evil one. The evil one would not get them. And we see him praying for this in verses 11 through 16. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Here Jesus, he is speaking as if he is already gone. He knows that he is leaving. Verse 11 says, I am no longer in the world. He knows what's going to happen next. He's about to leave. He's about to die. He's about to rise again. And he's about to ascend back into heaven with the Father. But Jesus, out of his love and care, he is concerned for his disciples. Because while he's leaving, they're not. They're, while he's going to be out of the world, they are going to be in the world. And so because he's concerned for them, he prays. And he prays in particular that the Father would keep them in his name. That they would be kept from the evil and they would be kept from the devil. And this idea of the word keep here, it's the idea of keeping them in the faith. Keeping them focused upon the Lord, keeping them standing strong and not get distracted by the temptations or the things in this world to take their focus off of God and to draw them away from Christ. And up to this point, so far, Jesus, being with them, he has protected them. And we're told that none of them have fallen away, except for Judas. Now, this is said here so that people understand that it's not like Jesus has a 99.9% success rate. And that 0.1% Judas fell off the wagon. No, it's a 100% success, success rate because Judas, from the very beginning, has been foretold by the scriptures, was to be the one who betrayed him. The son of destruction mentioned back in Psalm 109 who would fall away and be eternally lost. That was part of God's plan. For all of God's people, he is indeed going to keep. And that's we see what has happened so far. But now Jesus is leaving. And the disciples are probably concerned. And so Jesus being concerned for them, he prays in verse number 11. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. Now, if you notice here, he calls God Holy Father. And this is the only time in the Bible where these two words are used together. And Jesus uses these here for a reason. Again, remember, he's praying out loud, so he's knowing the disciples are hearing him, and he knows that we are reading this here today. And he says it intentionally. Because it reminds us that the word holy means to be set apart. So here you have a God who is set apart from it all, who is above it all. And this is adding to the prayer because Jesus is praying to the God who is set apart to set these people apart for his purpose. And that purpose being that they may be one as he and the Father are one. He's praying that you and I would be set aside, that we would be kept for God's purposes, that we would be one as he and the Father is one. Now, that's a weird statement. And it's easy to maybe say, well, is he talking about us being God? Because the Father and Son, they are one. They're part of the Trinity. They're they're divine. But no, that's not what it's saying. The idea here is if you think about the Father and the Son, and the Spirit too, they have the same goal. They have the same purpose, that God would get glory in the world. Everything that they do is for God's glory and for the good of the people. And the idea here too is that God's people will be those that are also united in that common mind and that common purpose, that all we do in our life would be for God and for His glory. That we would want to do His will And we want to share his son in this world. And so that's what he prays, that he would keep them so that they would stay in that. Because once he leaves, they're going to be tempted to fall away. We look at the world, there are plenty of temptations we have to face that we might fall away from the Lord. And so what Jesus does is he prays that the Father would keep his disciples from three temptations in particular. This includes us today as well. We need God's help with. And the first temptation we see is that we would find joy in Jesus, not in the wrong places. There are many things in this world that tell us, oh, I'll give you joy. There are many times we look to get joy in all the wrong places. If you think about it, the world is filled with shiny stuff. 
that distract us. It's full of things that seem great, but actually aren't great. If you just look at your life, think about all the sin that tempts you. Think about the world today and how the world lives. We as Christians live differently. And it's like here they are at this big party. They're celebrating. And we as Christians aren't attending that party. As we grow up, we don't like to be the person that's left out. I think there's often a temptation. We don't like to feel left out either in the world we live in. So there's a temptation for us to give up our faith or to compromise our faith in order to fall in with the world and to enjoy the things of the world. But we're reminded that the things of this world do not last. But the joy that comes from Jesus does last. You look at the end of verse 13, Jesus prays that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The understanding here is that he prays his disciples will not find joy in the world, but find the joy that is in him that fulfills them completely, that nothing else can do. Because the things in this world will come and they will go, but if you have Jesus Christ and his salvation and his love, that is a joy you can have even on your hardest day. But that's not the only temptation he mentions. The second temptation is that we wouldn't give in to fear and anxiety because we are not of the world. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, in Christ we are a new creation. And so we are distinct from the world. We stand out from the world. Jesus tells us this twice in this passage to get that point across. In verse number 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. In verse number 14, just as I am not of the world, they are not of the world. The idea is here as Christians, as disciples, we are going to stand out. We are going to be different. And just as the world hated Jesus for being countercultural and standing on the truth of God, the same is going to happen to us. And so what Jesus prays here is that you and I would stand firm upon the truth and that God would hold us fast to keep us, to help us to keep the faith and to not compromise, but to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to him no matter what the world might say. So that's the second temptation. But there's one last temptation that we often have to deal with. That it's not as easy to be seen here. But if you look, Jesus prays in verse number 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You notice Jesus prays that we don't, aren't taken out of the world. The idea that we are still in the world. But there's often a temptation for us as Christians to draw back from the world. Because if you think about it, we're not of the world, but we are still in the world. But we try to get away from it. If you look at history, you see many hermits or maybe Christian communes that they've come up with that are out in the middle of nowhere, where they try to get away from the world and live in a Christian life, and that's it. But I think even as the church today, sometimes we are tempted, well, you look at the world and see how bad it is, and we, we come together with our people, right? And we just try to weather the storm until Jesus returns. The truth is that we are still in the world. And we have a job to do. We have a mission to share Christ and his kingdom with the world. Which we can't do if we're not in it. Now that doesn't mean you conform to it like so many churches sadly have done. It doesn't mean you give up God's truth. It reminds us that we are to be engaging our culture today with the truth of God. With the gospel. And as difficult as that might be, we're encouraged here because Jesus is praying that our God will be with us throughout it all. That he will keep us throughout it all. As much as the world doesn't want to hear it. And there's so much more that we can say about this. But we're reminded, Jesus, he's praying to keep us from the evil one, to keep us from these temptations, to keep us faithful. There's one last thing he prays for us, which is a positive thing. He thinks he wishes will happen, prays it will happen which is that you and I would be sanctified. Look at verses 17 through 19. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. They also may be sanctified in truth. Now, this word sanctify, it's a big word. Um, And the word consecrate actually comes from the same Greek word that's used for sanctify. That's used for the word holy. They are all connected. The idea is that you are to, we are to be set apart. And so what Jesus is praying here is that the Father would set us apart in two different ways. 
One, that he would set us apart in the sense that we would be made more like him. He would be sanctified. We would be made more like Jesus, not in divinity, but in how we think and how we speak and how we live. That we would reflect Christ more and more in our lives. Because if we are gods, then as we read in that first scripture lesson, because our God is holy, we must be holy. For what he has done for us, and he has saved us, and we are his people, we too must reflect him in our life. But this is not something we can do on our own. We need God's help. And that's why Jesus prays that God would help us. That he would set us apart. He would sanctify us in this in his life. Helping us to have his glory as our main goal. Helping us to live in a way to do what God wants to do. And that we would also hate what God hates in sin. And if you look at your life as a Christian, as you continue on in your walk with Jesus, as your life progresses... Jesus is praying that you would be made more and more like Christ as time goes on. And we're all there. We all need to be sanctified because none of us has arrived at perfection. Every single one of us, me included, still has growing to do on this side of heaven. And so what that means is we need God's help to do that. And what, how he does that then is he does that by his truth. The truth that is verse 17 says is the word of God. And then not only that, that we would be set apart not only to be sanctified, to be made like God, but set apart for a particular mission. It says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. He is going to go send the disciples into the world. They are going to be set apart for this task. And so you and I have been set apart for a certain task as well. We're called to be missionaries into this world for Christ, wherever we might be. So often we think about those that are sent out into the world as foreign missionaries. The truth is, all of us have a mission field wherever we are. In our jobs, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, wherever we are. To show forth Christ in all that we do. And God has set us apart for that. We like to think about how we get so much from Jesus. But also... Because we get so much from Jesus, we're called to give as well. Just as we are to receive, we are to give as well. One person said that Jesus saves us so that he can send us. Yes, we are saved. Yes, we have our salvation in him. But essentially, once that happens, Jesus is also giving you your marching orders. You have a job to do. You have a mission to complete. You have your Savior to share. And we do that in many different ways in our lives. It might be through sharing the gospel in our words. It might be through living the gospel out in our actions. But wherever it might be, we're all called to do that. We are set apart for that. And what a wonderful task that is, but also a difficult task. And that's again why Jesus prays for us in that task. If you look back at verse number 17, it says, To sanctify them in the truth, for your word is truth. In order to do that, not only to live a life that is honoring to God, but to go out in the mission, the world, we need God's truth in His Word. And that the Word we can think of of two different things. First, it's probably the one you think about right off the bat, is the Bible, God's Word. And so we look to the Scriptures to help us to live a life that's honoring to God. We look to the Scriptures to help us to go and to share Jesus with others. But also, this points us to Christ Himself. For Jesus Christ is the Word of God. You go to John 1.1, 1, 1, what does it say? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then down a little bit it says the Word became flesh. Jesus Christ is the Word of God who has been revealed to us. He is the truth of God in the Gospel. That through Him He would make us His people. Through Him He would go to that cross and die for our sins in order to save us. Then by saving us, he would send us. You see, just as God has sanctified us, he has set us apart for the mission in this world. If you look at Jesus, he himself has been set aside. She says in verse number 19, And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Now, this is talking about the second use of sanctification. Jesus doesn't need to be made more holy. Jesus is perfectly holy. But the idea Jesus was consecrated, he was sanctified he was set apart for a particular task if you think about you know items at home you have certain items that do particular things that they are set aside for that purpose if any of you like to do crafts in here 
you have your crafting scissors that you use for that in particular. You don't use them for anything else because it'll dull the blades. Or for those of you that cut grass, you have your grass cutting shoes, right? Because you don't want to ruin your new shoes or your decent shoes. You have your particular green shoes that are all over that you don't worry about getting messed up because that's what they're for. Or it might be a, a kitchen item or anything else. We all have things in our lives that are designated for a certain purpose. And that's the idea here is Jesus himself is designated for a certain purpose. A purpose to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what makes this even more wonderful, if you notice, and for their sake I consecrate myself. Jesus himself sets himself aside willingly to be the sacrifice for us. And so the Father sends him into the world so that by his death, by his resurrection, we as believers will be delivered from our sin. We would have the hope of everlasting life. And that also because of what Jesus has done, you and I too might continue to be sanctified in truth. Jesus would make us more and more like him each and every day. So it all comes back to Christ. Here you have Jesus praying for us. And you also have Jesus going through with what he does on the cross so that these things happen. We see the love of God in Jesus Christ for us. Not only in his death on the cross, but in the coming sanctification in our mission in this world, we see the love of Christ in our lives who was set apart for us that you and I might be set apart for him. And that's why he prays to the Father that he would continue to sanctify us, continue to set us apart, and continue to use us for his glory each and every day. And because of Jesus, it's all possible. And again, this section, I could preach five or six different sermons from just these three verses, but here you see the whole point of this part of Jesus' prayer. It's for us to encourage us to know that he is praying for us, that as broken, as sinful as we are, we are his. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his grace, because of his mercy, because of his love. He's praying for you. Not just as the, the church as a whole, but as you as an individual. He is praying for you here. And that shows you not only what he's praying, how wonderful it is that he's praying, but the fact that he's praying for you means he cares for you, that he loves you. And it's that love and that care that leads him to go to the Father to pray that you would stay faithful, that he would sanctify you, that he would make you more like him and help you to be a light in this world for him. And what an encouragement that should bring all of us here today because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's difficult. We live in a world that's painful, a world that, as we're told here, hates us because it hates Christ. And it's so easy to get disheartened. It's so easy to get discouraged when you look at what's going on out there. When you look at all the things that we have to go through. But just as it lifts our spirits when somebody says, I'll pray for you. When we read a passage like this. This lifts our spirits even more. Because here we have Jesus Christ himself praying for us. Not just simply saying he's going to do it, but he's already done it. And that should encourage all of us this week to go out and to live for him. Because we have a Savior who loves us, who has saved us, and who has prayed for us. And whatever the world might throw at us, we can always go back to this prayer and find encouragement to know that the words that he has said have indeed come to pass in the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer and know that your son has already prayed for us. To know that we are yours. To know that you keep us. To know that you continue to work in us to make us more like you each and every day. Lord, what a blessing it is to know that not only our loved ones here are praying for us, but the very love of Christ has led him to pray for us already and continuing to pray for us now, even in heaven. Lord, we need encouragement. We need help for all the problems and the pains that we face. Life can be hard, but yet to know that we have a Savior who loves us, who saved us, who prays for us, may that be our encouragement here today. May this be an encouragement to know that He has prayed that we would stay yours, that we would be more and more like you. And I pray that you would help us to seek that same goal in our own life. Lord, that we would steer clear of this world, that we would not give into temptation. 
and we'll live for you. Well, that we would live in a way that continues to grow more and more and make us more and more like Jesus. And Lord, then encourage us to know that while we might try to do it on our own, we can have an encouragement to know that you are with us to help us do what we cannot. To overcome that temptation. To show forth the love of Christ when it's hard, when it's difficult, and so much more. So Lord, we pray here today that you would continue to work in us. And we just thank you that you love us, that you've saved us, saved us, and that you keep on praying for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to stand together, our final hymn this morning is number 489, Christ for the World We Sing. quick reminder the deacons are going to meet following worship and receive now the benediction of the Lord and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all now and forevermore amen and amen May the peace.